I would like to welcome our guest, uh, Professor Jen. Professor Jen is a renowned professor of finance. Uh, he has been on our webinar uh, and sessions before. He is from the State University of New York and he's an active investor in stocks, bonds, options, real estate, and cryptocurrencies. Um, he's an authority in trading basics as well as advanced techniques and strategies. So hopefully he also has some tips on investing in this uh, new technology. Uh, and I'm sure he has a bunch of his own personal experience. He He's an expert in, in short selling strategies, market microstructure and financial regulation. Um, so welcome, Professor Jen. I'm excited to hear all about your explorations in this space as well as we share with the audience. Thank you, Kushbu, for a great introduction. And I think we are very early in the stage of this technology, like the internet was in 1990s. Uh, so we have a lot to come in the next decade or so. It's hard to predict. We can all make speculations about where we will go from here, but I'm sure there's going to be a lot of action and growth in this area in future. Absolutely. So I think these are the latest buzzwords. Sometimes everybody knows a little bit, and I'm sure I definitely don't know enough, um, but it's like everybody is looking at it from their angle and they're like, okay, what to make of this new concept? Um, and there's this whole fear, fear of missing out in case it was something important and you just didn't take action in time, which is why all of the people who are registered here and are joining us today here uh, are intending to ask. We have some comments already. Uh, please allow access to people on the waiting list. I don't see anybody on the waiting list. There's no waiting list. Uh, Doug here. And, and Mohan is saying Elon Musk had once tweeted that he doesn't believe that 3.0 to have a future when he cannot imagine anyone having VR goggles on them all day to stay in the metaverse. We will come to that. That's a, that's a, that's a, um, a fair thought from Elon Musk, but of course, he's a genius does not mean he's always right. Um, if that were the case, then people would just invest based on his tweets. We have invested based on his tweets, by the way. We were we were anyways bullish on Austin and Elon Musk tweeting about Austin in the US um, only made Austin more exciting for us um, overall from a, from a property investment perspective for buy property. So his tweets definitely have an influence. Moving on to why we joined here um, and Professor Jen, I think this is probably best served. Before we get into the actual metaverse discussions, um, for the interest of the wider audience, because we do not know how familiar everybody is with the various jargon, let's get some definitions aligned. So these are what we are referring to when we are talking about blockchain um, and Web 3.0 and metaverse and non-fungible tokens. So before we start using jargon, maybe take a moment to read through how we are using these definitions. And again, these definitions are only as good as somebody's perspective. Um, Professor Jen, anything else that you think that the users should be mindful as we go through the session? These are our disclaimer points. <laughs> no, I think these are important terms. And uh, as far as metaverse is concerned, we have some metaverses that are centralized. So like Facebook is getting into the space. They changed their name to Meta and Microsoft is trying to get into the space. So we will call them centralized metaverses, but I'm a believer in decentralized economy. And uh, when it comes to decentralized metaverses, some of them are Decentraland, Sandbox, and they are built on uh, blockchain. So for example, Decentraland is built on blockchain, which means the governance of that uh, platform is not in the hands of a central authority. So that is the idea mm -hmm. of uh, having a real, real virtual reality on a blockchain. So you do not uh, have to worry that tomorrow the central authority will change the rules of the system. The rules are governed by the users of the system. Okay. So as you were saying, Professor Jen, I think uh, 
And as you were hinting, there is talk about metaverse. Every large corporate is trying to get in. Um, and it's obviously way more than just the gaming community. Everybody from CVS, JP Morgan, by the way, by properly, we're also getting an office in there. Uh, in the metaverse and we and we'll give you a sneak preview of what our office is going to look like shortly um, actually if you stay till the end that's when you will get the sneak preview of the land we haven't only bought the land yet um so yeah i think with covid this is it and i think this is what you were referring to professor jan that uh with facebook changing name to meta suddenly the whole world is talking about metaverses yeah, you can see on the Google Trends, uh, they decided to change their name in October and you see a certain spike in the number of searches people have made for the word metaverse. Yep. Awesome. So what is a metaverse? I mean, I think Professor Jen and I actually uh, debated this out for a while last night on, on how the metaverse meant different things uh, to the two of us uh, in reality. And so I'll share mine, but if, if the people here in the audience have a certain view of the metaverse uh, or a certain perspective or definition of their own, feel free to put it in the chat box for everybody to share. So in my mind, metaverse was just a virtual 3D world, primarily on blockchain. So I was very blockchain centric to say, hey, the blockchain is critical to a metaverse. And of course, in an ideal state, I would want all metaverses to be moving in and out of each other. But it's a 3D virtual environment. It's like being in a game uh, with your own stuff. That's what it means to me. Professor Jen. Yeah, so I thought, or I think that the already have some prototypes of uh, metaverse uh, for a while. So for example, games like Fortnite, which I don't play, so I do not know as much about it as some of the people who are here. So Fortnite, the Minecraft, Roblox, they are, these are all virtual prototype of uh, virtual reality and they are centralized. So they are not on a blockchain. And also now Facebook has something called as workflow where you can have meeting in virtual reality. So that's again, a centralized ex example of a centralized metaverse. And when we talk about metaverses on Ethereum blockchain, for example, Decentraland, they are decentralized uh, metaverses. Yeah. So as far as the definition is concerned, it is basically a 3D version of the internet. So you meet people in a virtual reality, you interact with them, you can have meetings in this virtual reality space. So in the last few months, I have heard about uh, some concerts, music concerts in the space. Uh, so you can have, and like JP Morgan opened their own launch, launch there recently. So the, the opportunities or the possibilities are endless. You can think about people can place advertisements there, or if I want, I can have a party there. I can have my own house there. I can invite people mm -hmm. over and have a party there. So the possibilities are endless, but if you wanted to list like four things you could do, like you can play games, you can have entertainment, for example, music concert, you can have remote work. So we have seen during pandemic that people went to Zoom, but now people are not interested in doing Zoom meetings anymore because they don't feel real. You don't have the face time like you do in real and office. But so now we are thinking, what if they, we can have a real FaceTime in a metaverse? So without going to office, can I have the same feeling that I have in the office? So what that will do is it will reduce cost for corporations. So when I make a business trip, I fly in a business class to meet someone, I could have the same feeling in a metaverse. I could have the same kind of um, interaction with somebody. And we could have corporate events. So yeah, we cannot have like beers and wines in the metaverse. Like we could not have happy hour there, but but we could have corporate events uh, in a metaverse that will feel as real as meeting in an office. So again, like I said, there are two kinds of metaverses, one that are controlled by central entity and probably Facebook is going to come up with their own version of metaverse and they have control over it and you have to use their device, Oculus, to enter the metaverse. And there are decentralized ones like Decentraland and Sandbox uh, and where the users have the governance of the project. 
So this is the basic yeah. definition of a metaverse. So like for us as by properly, I think um 50% of our team is remote, so not in Toronto. And they're actually spread out in different geographies. So we have people across Thailand, India, uh, Spain, Dubai, even in Canada, it's Toronto and Vancouver. So we have a, a wide range of time zones. And actually part of our team has been hanging out in the metaverse. Uh, we took an office space in this place called uh, Virbella office space and uh, my engineers and I would just hang out there and if they just needed to talk to me they literally their avatar would walk over to me and if they spoke into their mic I could hear them so like hey could I have a question it did not require a meeting it was like walking over uh, as in an office setup it was cool and I have spent time at a bar in uh, Decentraland actually uh, also it wasn't real BI it was just virtual stuff um, but it was a bar nevertheless. So yes, you can you can totally see hanging out in the metaverse. If people can spend an hour on Facebook, Instagram every morning, um, this is the next version of it, I guess. So I wanted to ask you this question since you are in real estate. So I don't think this will affect the property prices of residential real estate because you know you gotta mm -hmm. live in a house. But what about office space? Do you think that? the need for office space would go down if people start having offices in virtual reality, like in, let's say, uh, Decentraland or any other platform? What do you think about that? Um, so I don't think this is what's going to drive the demand for office down. I think just the move towards that hybrid where remote work is an accepted part of the culture. I mean, there are so many companies that I know of did not even give laptops to their employees, even in today's world. Because they didn't think it was important. You came to office, you opened your desktop and worked there. Why would you take work home at all? Um, and those companies are now comfortable with employees coming maybe once a week just for the team morale to office. So clearly there's been a shift there, which is what may impact office prices. Um, this would probably become more of a, a connectivity thing. So rather than talking on Slack or a Discord or, or a Google Messenger or Office Messenger or whichever one people use, you could just be in the metaverse. I mean, I log into Messenger and I'm logged in all day and people ping me when they want to talk. I could just be logged into the metaverse and be there doing my thing. And if somebody wants to talk to me, they can come. So it's probably more um, closer to the communication and connectivity piece than the physical piece uh, of office, office real estate. That's my take on it. But again, there's so many companies that need to come together for the metaverse to happen on a mass scale um, that I'm not so sure it's, we are all already there, at least not in the next five years. Okay, okay. So so on that, this is some of the stuff and you were talking about Oculus and I know you are a headset owner. Um, the metaverse is, has a little bit of everything, I think. Um, it's a little bit of Feb 3.0 that you were talking about. So having decentralized autonomous organizations is core to a metaverse rather than it always being centralized. That's the preferred. People don't want to do a Facebook again with all of the issues they have discovered about it over time. It has a little bit of the gaming component. The gaming world is far ahead of the rest of us who don't do gaming on a regular basis because they've been doing stuff in the virtual world for a long time. And then the mixed reality is basically um, when you are using devices on and off. So you're in and out of digital world. So it's things like um, a combination of augmented reality and virtual reality all coming together, which means if you were talking about a Pokemon Go, that's not you being in the virtual world, that's you being in the real world and having an overlay of virtual world. And there's now a lot of street arts that's in that space. Um, when you're talking about headsets, you're talking about putting on the headset and being in the virtual world. But then there's a whole spectrum between being completely in the virtual world and completely in the real world. And somewhere in between, I think, uh, is where the metaverse will hopefully probably uh, kind of settle down. So it's, Metaverse is not just the virtual world. It's all of the things that would put it together. It's almost like saying cyberspace or internet. It's not one thing. It is the hardware, the software, the tech, 
um, the network all put together that enables that environment. These are some of the, the VR, AR stuff. And you, you play a lot of games, uh, Professor Jen, also, right? Yeah, I have installed some games on my Oculus. They are mostly for fitness that I've been using. I'm not so much into gaming. If I if I played games, I think I would better be equipped to invest in some of these tokens. Uh, so yeah, this is like, a, this is a definition or the key terms that uh, Metaverse should have, which was given by Matthew Ball, who's a who's a big uh, proponent of uh, metaverse. So basically the way metaverse works, it, it, is, it is never resets or never pauses. So it's like a city. So like Decentraland, if you go there, it's always running. It is a city. A city never stops or never ends. It is co running continuously and it is live. So when you go there, so let's say if I go to Decentraland right now and you go there at the same time, you'll see each other right there. So it is synchronous and live and there should be no limit on concurrent users. So again, this is a computing problem. If you talk about Fortnite, when the Fortnite, when they do meetings, I think there's a limit of 100 users per, per meeting. So we should not have a meeting limit like that on concurrent users. And also the, the user should be able to create assets. So in Decentraland, users can create assets. For example, they can create skins, they can create clothes, and they can sell it to other users. So users can be rewarded for the work they do. So that is another uh, idle feature of metaverse. Also the content should be rich. Like if you go to the metaverse, it should look like there are a wide range of contributors. There are different things you can do. If you go to metaverse right now, you see different kinds of things. Like you said, you see a bar there, you see a bank there. So you should be able to see different contributors there. And finally, one piece that is very important is interoperability. Interoper so this is what you were talking about, that if uh, Metaverse is centralized, how, how am I going to use an asset I have in Facebook's Metaverse and Microsoft's Metaverse? But if you are in a Metaverse that is on Ethereum blockchain, and when you move from one Metaverse to another, you can still use your asset. So that's one advantage of having blockchain that any asset that you own in one Metaverse, you can see it in another Metaverse as well. So let's say you wear certain kind of clothes, certain kind of style you have, you could take your avatar in a different metaverse as well. So these are essential features of a metaverse. Yeah, I think and that's one of the reasons why um, blockchain or Web 3.0 is becoming so um, kind of uh, associated with metaverses because Web 3.0 allows you to rewrite and own stuff in the digital world. Right now, nobody owns anything in the digital world. Anything that I do on Facebook is not owned by me. Um, and so I can use it, but the stuff belongs to Facebook. Same with all of the games. And so I think in the blockchain, if I paid money for it, I could say that, hey, this NFT jacket is actually mine and I can just wear it wherever I want uh, because I can prove it's mine and I paid for it, which is what makes the metaverse suddenly a little more attractive. Than, than playing a game that's, to your point, centralized, where I spend money and that's stuck with that game. So I am guessing most people who have come here have come from an investing perspective. So we thought maybe we'll take an angle to it. But I think there are two questions, Professor Jen. Maybe we address that before we move into the investing piece. Uh, so somebody is saying, I hear many people saying Metaverse is a hoax. And it's a marketing strategy by a bunch of companies to make some quick money. Can you please comment on it? Do you want to take that? No, for, uh, yeah, you can also take it, but I'll just make a comment. Like if it was just a hoax, like Facebook won't be changing their name from Facebook to Meta. Like it's a $600 billion company. And Microsoft has just bought Activision Blizzard. So all these big companies are spending billions of dollars. So they won't be spending so much money if it was just a hoax, you know? So that's what I think. What, what do you want to say about it, Kushbu? Metaverse is a concept. So it isn't a hoax or a reality in my mind. Maybe it's a marketing strategy, whatever it is. If 
it is something that will keep people hooked and make them spend uh, one hour of their time and and give give uh, their attention then it's real like you know, what do you say as is an advertisement is it real is it a hoax it's kind of like that so it's like saying that if it's a it's a concept that gets people's attention, then maybe it has merit in it. And then at the end of the day, it will depend on whether the concept grows, whether it gets support from the rest of the system. I mean, virtual reality isn't new. Virtual reality headsets came first in 1991, 30 years ago. If we had put money in virtual reality headsets 30 years ago, I mean, we would have not made any money clearly by now because it got nowhere till now but does not mean that it will not get far uh, in future as well. We've already seen um, a lot of activity on the virtual connections like Microsoft Teams, Zoom, and all of the others with the pandemic. It brings me to the second question. You've seen the pandemic, a significant increase in mental health issues despite the rise in technology like Zoom to stay connected? How would the metaverse really make it something beneficial enough for people to consider investing rather than in person? So I want to take this one because if you ask me, Zoom is not about getting connected. It's about doing meetings. We did those in conference rooms before and now we do that in Zoom rooms. I have never set up a Zoom chat to just chit chat about, you know, like I'm thinking about ordering, where would you order from? I've never done that with Zoom. It is like a conference room. I go there with an agenda, with a very defined objective of the meeting, and I need to come out with some output from it. That's not how you connect with people. And I feel like the metaverse isn't about that. The metaverse is about trying to replicate what you would do at the coffee machine otherwise in real world, in that world. It is kind of replicating stuff like Facebook. So if you go hang out at Facebook, you instead go hang out at a, I don't know, at a boat in this, at a, like a boating yacht place somewhere in the central land. So that's kind of how I think. Um, mental health issues, well, that's something I wouldn't even get into. There's a whole gamut of things uh, that it unlocks. I don't think Metaverse makes it any worse. Uh, than what it already is in terms of being a virtual world. It definitely unlocks some unplanned encounters. What do you think, Professor Jen? Yeah, I agree with you. And also, uh, I think Metaverse is getting more and more immersive. So the idea is to feel that you are there. Yeah. So what we felt with Zoom was not the same that we are going to be seeing as the metaverse gets more uh, technologically advanced, you know? So we will feel as if we are there, we are meeting that person in reality. So we will not feel that we are missing the FaceTime that we miss when we do Zoom. So I think that's what it's gonna be like. Yeah, somebody has a startup idea right there, uh, Michael Megan. Do you believe the hospitality industry can have presence in the metaverse? Restaurants can have a virtual presence and will be able to provide food through the establishments or ghost kitchens throughout the cities. Enjoy the food physically, but the dining experience is virtual. Yeah, I love that. I wouldn't mind uh, because right now when I order from Skip the Dishes or Uber Eats, they are like such unknown entities to me. I know them only from their name. I have no idea or no way of visualizing a lot of them. If I could go to the metaverse and order and then collect it at home, I would not mind that. And I think Domino's and McDonald's are trying to do that. You can actually go to the Metaverse store and order and get food delivery at home physically. Not virtual food, real food, like real pizza. Especially if you want to meet a friend who is not in the same city and you cannot go to dinner together, it'll be a good way to socialize with them. Yes. Um, okay, so talking about investing, these are some high level concepts in the context of the metaverse that I thought is worth laying down. So based on where you choose to invest, you could be in the high risk, low risk zone. A lot of people are obviously investing in the core blockchain infrastructure, which is the Ethereum, Solana, Polygon. 
Web 3.0, often called the layer one. This is the base on which a lot of the versions of everything is built. Right now, Ethereum obviously predominates this whole space. Um, I think 60, 70% is on Ethereum, but it has its own challenges. Um, and so you could invest in that. I own a bunch of, I've invested like a little bit of Ether and Professor Jain invests in Bitcoin, Ether and, and a bunch of others, right, Professor Jain? I also own some um, mana tokens, which are a yeah. native token of Decentraland. So you are on the next layer as well. So it's the token layer. So let's go to that one. So Sand is the Decentraland token. So on all of these structures, you have the next layer, which is which is kind of their cryptocurrency, so to say, or token. Um, obviously, they are not interoperable. They are obviously pegged to the underlying assets. So um, X mana equal to Y ether. So they always pegged so you know what their relative value is but a lot of them do not have like an absolute independent valuation. And if there is enough of it, it will be like any currency of any other country. So um, if, if you own some of them, that's of course the next one. The next layer is where you have the land and I think somebody has a question on land, um, which is tokenized land like Sandbox, Decentral Land and Cornerstone. There's a lot of, chatter around how the metaverse land is like real land. It is like buying land in New York, Manhattan a hundred years ago. I would argue it's not because that real land has a real physical benefit. It is shelter over your head. This land cannot uh, fulfill that basic need, unfortunately. So it's not comparable, but I don't think it means that it doesn't have value. The value is in the network. So if enough people are going to decentral land, I would be open to having an office where people can walk in and say, hey, bye properly, I have these questions for you. I wouldn't mind that. If having an office with a large billboard there gets people's eyeballs and attention, I would have presence there. So it has value, but maybe not necessarily equal to land. The reason it's compared to land is because all of these Worlds, which is Sandbox, Decentraland, um, Cornerstone, which is where I own some land. Um, they have limited the supply. So they've said, as a community, the whole community has agreed to say, you know what? This is the total amount of land that will be there in Decentraland ever. And so it cannot go up because, I mean, not, not, in not like definitive, but it is going to be difficult to increase the supply because then the community members have to all vote together to increase the supply. And if I hold a piece of land, would I want to dilute my value? Of course not, especially if it is valuable. If you were in, in central Manhattan and you, would you agree to devalue your land? Of course not. And so it's, it's, it's one of those things that cannot necessarily happen and which is why they have gotten this comparison to a land and of course we can build virtual buildings, hold virtual concepts, have virtual bars to go to, have virtual art galleries, all of that stuff. But that's the land layer. The next layer is NFT. So when I'm in Decentraland, I can actually buy stuff from other vendors. I can wear, I can buy a jacket that I can walk around with. I can buy a cap, shoes, earrings, lots of stuff. Those are the NFT assets. And finally, is the user or consumer, which is you, me. The higher up in the pyramid you are in investing, the higher the risk. Um, that's kind of my Maslow's hierarchy of metaverse investing uh, or Kushbu's hierarchy of metaverse investing. Um, Professor Jen, thoughts on this one? Well, I just wanted to highlight that uh, mana is like uh, our sand is a fungible token. So every mana will have the same value. But when you decide to buy a land and decentral land, depending on where it is. So there's a genesis uh, in, uh, in, in decentral land. And around that, the land properties are higher. But if you're in a remote corner, just like any city, the land prices are lower. So you have to think about where you want to buy the land, where it will attract more people. So each, each token is a non-fungible token. So the, these land pieces or land plots are non-fungible and uh, these NFT assets are non-fungible, but these tokens are fungible tokens. Right. Um, 
There's a couple of questions. So there's a question which says, crypto is used in Web 3.0 metaverse. However, many countries have banned crypto. China banned it, India restricted it, and compared it to tulip mania of the 17th century. Do you still believe metaverse will withstand these challenges? I mean, I would say metaverse is a concept. Maybe it will evolve with all of these challenges. Maybe it will um, change and develop into something that's acceptable. But as a concept, it has already proved that there's a lot of value. The fact that on a blockchain, things are immutable, which means if you made a mistake 20 years ago, it's still there in the records, um, has some value. There's a reason why people have credit history and land records and land registry. There's value in having something that's trustworthy, immutable, and recorded. And so the core infrastructure and the concept has value. The form it will take, I don't know which form it will take. That's kind of where we are right now. Um, but the core concept is already proved and there are enough countries that are actually building upon it a lot. Estonia is a small country, but UK government has come out with a lot of papers. Um, the large banks in Canada actually did a pilot about a few years ago on using blockchain for um, cross-border payments. So governments are slower to move, but they are over time recognizing that there is value in the core concept. Professor Jen? Yeah, I agree with you. And also, like, uh, the question came about crypto being similar to tulip mania. It has been doing well for so many years, and uh, some countries have made it a uh, legal tender, maybe. And like yeah, even like Joe Biden yeah. gave an executive order a couple of weeks ago, they want to start their own uh, stable coins. So, uh, so people were thinking the same about the cryptocurrencies. And uh, I think that there's more uncertainty about metaverse, where it will go, uh, depending on how companies and decide to take it, like what kind of developments they, they make. Uh, but I think, uh, there is a lot of potential. And I think we have a slide on challenges, right? Uh, Kushbu next or something, yeah. yeah. So sticking to investing, uh, I feel like Professor Jen, this is where we are kind of heading into your territory. Uh, you are an active investor and I'm the professor of finance, so maybe you are better placed to take some of these uh, ideas forward. So I think this is a great job done in, in like in the sense that if you want to invest in the equity market and metaverse, then these are the companies that operate in VRAR. These are the companies that operate on the software side. So if you do not, if you think that investing in tokens is more risky, you want to invest in equity, these are the companies you go with. Uh, and on the next slide, I think there's a slide on the ETF. There's an ETF for yes. metaverse stocks. So if you wanted to take less risk and only invest in stocks that generate cash flow, you could invest in an ETF that doesn't uh, make investment in, uh, in metaverse companies, you know? So you could do that. But if you want, if you've had a bigger belief in decentralized economy and metaverse, I think you go go buy tokens. And uh, if you don't know how to pick the right land, I think a good way to buy would be a token of that decentralized economy because you may not be aware which land is better or not. You might actually need a real estate agent, you know. Soon in the metaverse, you will have real estate agents. And not only that, once you buy a land, you can actually do, you can do development on that. You can build a high rise or you can build an office so you need to hire developers to do development on the land if you do not have skills to have or if you do not have plans on what you're going to do with the land you might just buy the the tokens of uh, that decentralized economy yeah um yeah talking about options yes we have uh ets that invest in public companies, right? Uh, these are all public companies that are in turn investing in the metaverse. So that's the safest way of saying. But then you also have actually metaverse indexes, um, which is saying they are a combination of all of the tokens out there. 
Um, and of course, they have their own criteria. So token must be a Korean based, for example, for these guys. They won't take anything that has less than three months of history, um, should be available on the DEX exchange, and so on. And you can actually just do a virtual land portfolio. Maybe we will do it as a buy properly uh, option, but we will see. So there, there's the decentralized land um, options, the sandbox options. You can obviously do a virtual land portfolio. The higher you go, obviously, in this, um, in this uh, pyramid, the risk you are, and it's always safe to invest in public companies. But when you're investing in something like a metaverse, again, these numbers are just representative. I just wanted to build this chart out to give a sense of uh, the fact that it is risky and why diversification is important. So imagine you were investing in a metaverse asset, say an NFT or a land. Early success, let's assume 90%, 10% didn't launch. 50% reached a tipping point from that. 20% got to mass market. And 20% of that becomes a market leader. So if you invested when it was early on, which means at the launch stage, where the chances were 90% that it will launch, then your probability of success is 1.8%. That is a rather low probability. Um, the fact that it will become a metaverse asset that's of any relevance is 2%. So if you add up, you'll realize that your chances of success in something that's so early on as a concept is rather low, which is why it's important to make sure that you're not putting all your eggs in one metaverse basket and spreading it along, especially if you are investing earlier. So the earlier you are in this chain, the higher the risk, and therefore I think the more diversified it helps to be. Again, these numbers are my assumptions. They're not real, they're not always the same. It's, it's kind of how people would think about early investing. And we talked about these three, so you can invest in individual companies, you can invest in individual assets, or you can do ETFs. And by the way, Professor Jen, you would be happy to know that there are actually metaverse property agents uh, who can help you uh, buy land in the metaverse and also rent land in the metaverse. So there's a company called Rentable that does leasings. Um, they own a bunch of, and in fact, there's a the Canadian company also that's looking to launch something big where they are, they are um, building office towers that they want to lease out to people for rent. Actually, I wanted to buy land back in October last year, but my wife did not let me. So I just convinced her that, can I buy mana tokens instead? And she did let me. So like you were saying, buying mana token is less risky than buying the land itself. Yeah. Um, yeah, talking about investing, I think where we are on the metaverse spectrum, um, these are some of the challenges um, that we see, which haven't been solved for. Um, the hardware, obviously, some of the metaverses like Facebook are linked to a headset, which then becomes a challenge. I personally do not prefer any metaverse that is linked to a headset. Um, I want it to be browser-based option. So it's okay to have the headset, but it should be available without the headset also is my personal take on this. Um, but again, we're not the network is another problem and interoperability is something that hasn't been solved yet. So now today when I buy stuff on decentral land, I'm not actually able to take it to sandbox or I cannot take it to a corner store or vice versa. And they're not all standard. That's some of the challenges before any kind of mass adoption happens in this space. Anything, Professor Jen, that in your opinion, investors should be knowing or considering when they evaluate these? And also, like I just wanted to say, actually, I read that Decentraland is coming up with a VR headset for at the end of 2022. So they are going to integrate that in their platform. And also the second point here was networks. So right now when we do a Zoom call, even now actually sometimes I see that your, your video gets stopped, right? Like there's a, it freezes. But when we are actually doing a immersive VR, 
we are doing 3D rendering of videos. So we need much larger bandwidth and the latency time needs to be very short. So that's another problem that people are trying to solve how they will be resolved in, in, in a metaverse where we have 3D rendering of videos. Yeah. Um, and so was some was a question called why companies just tokens.com the owner of Decentraland not listed as the company to invest related to metaverse. Well, the list that we have is actually in no way exhaustive. This is just illustrative uh, and is limited by only our own individual knowledge. So I'm sure there are way more companies out there. I don't think tokens.com owns Decentraland, but I could be completely wrong on that one. Um, but yes, tokens.com is another company that invests in Web3 assets. Uh, they are Toronto-based and um, they do own a bunch of assets. And I believe they are looking to rent out. Uh, they are also property managers. But let me actually on that note, um, we talked about this and I don't have much of slides. So let me share my personal project <laughs> for you guys. Given that you guys are all captive, I'm going to share my personal stuff here. Um, so Dan, can you see my screen? Can you screen my screen? Professor Dan? Yeah, we can see the screen. Okay, awesome. So this is where I have bought the land. Um, this is where we and my property are looking to build the office. Um, we are close to the river, so we are not top of the hill. We are actually at the bottom of the hill, close to the river. We would have a tower similar to this for a buy property office. Looks like an ad, but that's kind of what's for me. Uh, any questions, anyone that we have not addressed? There's a question about which crypto exchange would you recommend? So I am based in the US, so I like Coinbase here. I think most trustworthy, publicly listed. Uh, I don't know if somebody's from Canada, what do you recommend, Kushbu? Um, interestingly, I also use Coinbase uh, just because it's one of the bigger ones. Um, but any of the top two to three large ones are okay. More questions, thoughts from people? I think I see something more. Bitbuy in Canada, yes. Bitbuy is uh, the one which it, I think it recently got acquired by Wonderfy. If I'm not wrong. And somebody had asked a question about how you build in Decentraland. I sent that person the link, but if you're interested, maybe I can buy a land and you can learn how to build. You can build something for me. <laughs> Oh, I would love that, yes. But Decentral land is really expensive because uh, the cheapest land there, like which is in some remote random corner, is also something like 30,000 Canadian dollars. So I just ran a poll on whether you'd be interested in buying virtual land in the metaverse. Um, um, I will put this out as a disclaimer. This whole webinar is not financial advice of any kind. This is completely community speculative discussion um, for our customers and other people who are interested in this space. Uh, Let's see if there are the questions. I think there are the questions. Okay, sure. So somebody's asking where I can buy land. So I'll so you can also answer, Kajbu, but uh, you can buy it on OpenSea. So yeah. OpenSea is a platform for buying uh, non-fungible tokens. 
So if you want to, I can share my screen and yes. show, or maybe you can show it, Kushbu, whichever oh, go ahead. works. Go ahead, President. Okay, so I'll share my screen. So you can see my screen now, right, everybody? Can you see my screen, Kushbu? Yes. So I opened OpenSea.io and I'm on this uh, platform for buying non-fungible tokens. Then you type Decentraland. So there are 97,000 items available from Decentraland. And when you click on it, you see all these land plots, right? So you see all these land plots. Let me minimize this. And the minimum price you see here, price is low to high and buy now. So the minimum price of a land I can buy is 3.3 ether, which is about $10,000. So, so you can see where is this land? You can see the coordinates of the land. So you can see where it is exactly in the central land. Like is it in a remote location or is it close to where the places are? So this is where you can buy land for decentral land. So Sandbox is not on Ethereum platform or is it on Ether? I forget. So you can and buy Sandbox land here. So you can buy Sandbox land as well. So yeah, I just wanted to share this. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, uh, I was wondering if you could also show them how it connects to your wallet maybe on OpenSea since you have it open. Okay, so I will go back. Uh, yeah, so here is again Sandbox, and I have my I have installed MetaMask extension on my browser. So if you want to see, um, you will see it. Uh, sorry. Um, here, MetaMask. So I have got MetaMask here. Uh, some closing on me, sorry. Yeah, here's MetaMask. And you can see I have got 0.16 Ether, right? So now if I want to place a bid, uh, So it is telling me you must authenticate with your wallet in order to make an offer on this item. And it will ask me to confirm the transaction in my wallet. So it is taking its own time, but what you need to do is you need to install MetaMask uh, wallet and you need to transfer some ether to your MetaMask wallet. So when you are trying to buy something, it will ask you to connect to your wallet and then you can place a bid or buy something. Yeah, that didn't work as I was planning, but you get the idea. In terms of the process, the way it will work is, say you went to Coinbase Exchange, you bought some Ether, you can move it to your Coinbase wallet or a MetaMask wallet. MetaMask is, they're both very popular. I use MetaMask wallet more. From the wallet, when you log into OpenSea, you can connect whichever wallet you're using, whether it's Coinbase wallet or MetaMask wallet to OpenSea, the marketplace. OpenSea is equal to Amazon, basically. <laughs> and then your MetaMask wallet or your Coinbase wallet is equal to your credit card. Um, you obviously have to put money into this wallet, so like a prepaid credit card. When you go to OpenSea, you choose something, it will draw if you have sufficient funds in the MetaMask wallet, you end up buying. And then there's something called Ether Scan, which is kind of where you can confirm that you actually own that stuff. And then the item will appear in your wallet as well as in your uh, Ether Scan address. That's usually how it looks like. I don't have a lot of Ether to be able to buy anything in Decentraland right now. Otherwise, I could have done a demo. Is there an ETF for virtual land buy? Um, there isn't one that I can recommend, but I know there are a lot of startups who are actually putting together REITs for virtual land. Um, so it's like a portfolio of virtual lands that you can invest in. Um, there are ETFs that would do tokens um, and there are REITs that would do virtual land effectively. But yeah, nothing that is so established that I could 
recommend or or even whether it is my go-to. Do you have any recommendations in case of buying land? I feel like anything NFT and land is a non-fungible token and therefore an NFT, you have to consider a few factors. The NFT is only as good as its community. So if you're going buying land, you have to see how big is the community? How fast is that growing? Uh, the second aspect would be how good are they? How much features they have built in the previous time and what is their roadmap looking like? So literally you are kind of evaluating some of this stuff like you would evaluate a startup if you were doing a venture investing, which means you are looking at their user base, their community base, their product roadmap, the features that have they have done and the features they are bringing on board. Um, and whether, and then the last thing and something that's not as obvious is their marketing capabilities. Because the community will grow if they have marketing capabilities. So these are some factors that I personally would consider when buying land. It's not the same as when you buy real land which is about location and transit, et cetera. This is a very early stage uh, thing. It is like uh, you don't know whether uh, New York will become a bigger city or San Francisco, or is it, um, is it someplace in North Carolina that's going to be the biggest city in US and, and you are betting that already. So you are looking at how much they can market, what they have already done in terms of marketing and what they can provide to the users in terms of features. So those are some of the things that I feel you have to look at. Professor Jen, do you have any thoughts on, have you bought any land and are you intending to buy any land? No, but when I wanted to buy, I would just buy on these bigger platforms because it is a network effect, right? So like, Although lands in San Francisco might be more expensive than Rochester, but still the potential for growth there is higher because there's a there's a network effect there, right? So although so land on these in decentral land might seem more expensive, but this is one of the most popular platform. So I would go with one of the bigger platforms. Yes. And since we are talking about investing, actually, why don't I share a resource, it's a little dated, it's from 2021. Um, I'm not associated with this, uh, the author of this uh, paper in any form or manner. They are not an investor, customer or any kind. So full disclaimer, I just found it on the internet, thought it was very useful and I am sharing with you guys. I'm sharing with everybody in the chat box but it's taking forever to go for some reason. We have a network problem, sorry. And then we have another, oh, you answered that one. How do you build something in the metaverse? Yeah. I mean, all of these uh, landowners provide a mechanism of building. They will provide you tools on how you can build stuff. Um, and so I think that's kind of how you would build. I think my file is taking forever. Um, but it's called ARC Invest. Um, an ARC Invest report. Hang on, I will just share the link given that I cannot seem to be able to send the file. Are you getting it, Professor Jen? Or is it stuck for you as well? No, I don't, I don't see anything. You don't see anything? In the chat window? Yeah. No, I don't. Oh, super strange. Let me try one more time. It's an interesting report on investing in the middle. I can, share, I can show how to buy again. If, yeah. So, Earlier, my meta was, mask was not connected, was not signed in. So all you do is you click on buy now and click on the checkbox. It is not letting me confirm because I don't have 3.3 .3 ether <laughs> on my meta mask wallet. So all you'll do is you'll say confirm checkout and then the 
the non-fungible token of the land will get transferred to your wallet. So that's all you have to do. So you have to get a MetaMask wallet and then connect it to OpenSea.io and then you can buy any land that you want to buy. Fabulous. All righty. So I think we are also um, out of time. And since I was not able to send the file, I'm sending a link to everybody on the chat bar um, so you can download it yourself because I'm not able to send you the file. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, if you have more questions, feel free to send our way uh, and have a great rest of the day.